interesting findings that you'll be sharing with us. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this should not be a very formal talk. I was thinking informal. I have to say, by the time I got to slide number 38, <laughs> I realized uh, it seemed like it's going to be a long talk. But hopefully, we can have a bit of discussion um, because lots of people here will have opinions on the things I'm saying. Some of you actually come from the places I have visited. In fact, I visited some of you who were sitting here while I was traveling. Um, so, this is a Let's start at the beginning here, right? Um, this is kind of a report back on a trip that I made to four, four East and Southern African countries. And I, I'm going to drop the Southern as I go along because uh, uh, you know, Zambia has some issues. And, and Zambia seems to think that they can choose whether they want to be in East Africa or Southern Africa. Um, you talk to certain Zambian people, so I'm just going to call them all East, East Africa also because there's some cultural similarities in what they do. So I thought I was going out there to learn how others do ICT 4D, which uh, I learned a little about that to establish some collaboration, which I thought I think uh, worked out quite well. Um, share some research findings and then and then introduce people to the, the things that we seem to value and the things that I seem to value in, in my research as well. So this was the original purpose, and we'll see how this evolved over time. Um, so I'm going to do this, this, this talk is kind of in two parts. The first part is going to be a, a zoom through where I went and, and what I did in these places and uh, some basic things I came across. And then I'm going to specifically talk about these notions of research, development, and innovation um, as it cuts across all of these different places. So we can we can chat as we go through this, or please feel free to interrupt with your thoughts as we go along. So I started off by going to Zanzibar, and no, you can't go from Cape Town to Zanzibar. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't want to have little lines that connect all of the airports along the way. Um, and Zanzibar, for those of you, so I, I, some demographics just to give you some context here. There's about a million people. Um, there are a small number of universities. There's one state university, two private universities. The state university is fairly, I'll talk a bit about that as well. And I thought I would take it to kind of the kind of human development index. So Zanzibar is number 152 out of 187 on the Human Development Index. South Africa, let's see who remembers my last talk. It's like a test. I got 120-ish, right? It's been about 120-ish in the Human Development Index. Just for those of you who don't uh, pay attention to the Human Development Index, it looks at uh, traditional economic indices, but it's, it especially looks at things like um, Longevity, so how long are you, going, uh, are you going to live and how well are you going to be educated? So they're trying to get some kind of sense of quality of life. Okay, so things to note about Zanzibar, it's actually part of Tanzania, right? So Tanzania, uh, Zanzibar, this is, you know, although the, if you go to Zanzibar, you get a sense that, that actually this is an independent culture and a lot of people think that way. Um, politically, it's part of Tanzania. So, uh, I think I sprinkled some of these pictures that I took along the way, and then as we go later into the, into the presentation, we get to some stock images at the end. Um, but um, there were some interest, there were lots of interesting cultural things about Zanzibar. So I threw in some photographs which I thought you might in the travel or con uh, discussion more interesting. Uh, there were some unique, there were some uh, unique species of animals, uh, tortoises. Uh, Coral leaf, right? I really think Zanzibar had this. this you just need to see it in some places, look into the water, and you can see this. Uh, a very important part of, the color, part of the history of Zanzibar was actually slave trade. So if you go to Zanzibar, you'll find that a lot of what defines them is this link back into uh, this, this history that this was one of those parts of the world that was a, a center in the slave trade. Uh, so I went to various different places. I think you can see Haji's back in one of those photographs. Um, Various places in Zanzibar that, in fact, um, have been have somehow preserved some part of that history, so that people can go back and remember uh, what happened in the past. Um, also, I learned, which I didn't know before, that Zanzibar had very strong links, and you can't really see this, but this, these are paintings of uh, previous rulers of, of Zanzibar, but they are actually Middle Eastern because Zanzibar was, was had very strong links to the Middle East at some point in time, right? um, and they, they have somehow influenced history and what happened at the moment. This last picture you can't really see much on. Uh, 
is a picture of, of from the steps of one of the universities. Right? So I was listening to the university and the students were just sitting in, in, in groups under the trees studying, which I think is quite nice. You know, we don't generally do that around here. Okay, uh, State University of Zanzibar. So this is my first stop. Um, they have a department of computer science and information technology, uh, which is part of the school of natural sciences. It's about to become a separate school. However, they have this very flashy looking building that, uh, that you, can't, you, go, you can't get a sense of scale. It looks like a three-story building. It's probably one and a half times the size of this, uh, to give you some context. They have about 24 staff in computer science and IT, nobody with a PhD. But they're expecting people who have PhDs to arrive very soon. And they're, they're trying to think about what happens as the department evolves. They don't, they only have an undergraduate program, of course, because they don't have a PhD. And, and then they have something interesting, that the campus IT is also kind of managed by this department. It's a small university, right? Um, but you know, don't, don't assume this only happens in small universities. I remember one, one visit to UKZ and I discovered that the, it wasn't the campus, the IT, I think it was the faculty's IT that was run by computer science at UKZ a few years ago. I don't know if they still do that. <coughs> okay, um, what did I do? Well, I gave seminars like it was going out of fashion. So I gave three seminars in, in Zanzibar, uh, one to the computer science department. I have to say this was the, a mind change, uh, well, a life changing experience. You walk into the room and there's virtually no space to walk to where you in the seminar because absolutely everybody in the department has come. Right? <laughs> first year, second year, third year, they're all there. Right? Uh, so that was the first seminar I gave. Then I, I gave a, a talk on open access to library because they, they asked for it. Um, and I gave a public seminar. The university has this public seminar series of some sort. Um, and I spoke about preserving African heritage. Um, and some things that I noticed in, in, besides the seminars, I had meetings with staff and I realized that, that pretty much all the staff are planning for the studies. Right? Absolutely everybody I spoke to has a plan. They either currently enrolling for some master's degree or they're about to, or they're enrolling for a PhD or about to. Now when I say currently enrolling for a master's degree, it's because um, they, they don't have people without master's degrees who are teaching, but they are people who are full-time tutors are part of the department. Um, and they are people who only have that, that degree that starts for the masters. Um, there's, not a, there's almost no research going on, right? Because they don't have this research culture. I, I was interested to find that when I walked to a library, they had almost nothing in the library. It's a new university. There was very little in the library. But they were very clear about this. We don't want more books. We want all electronic resources, right? So they're trying to think about just you know, carving out some kind of future scenario for the university. Um, so, so this is what all, the, what all that I'm going to say about each stop. I went to Uganda next. Um, Uganda has 36 million people. It's uh, relatively <coughs> sizable. It's <coughs> comparable to South Africa, if you think of it that way. Eight public universities, a lot of uh, little private institutions. Um, the, well, the universities in most of these places I don't have the same kind of profile as South Africa, where we have a number of large universities. Most of them have one key university, or two or three key universities, and the rest are, uh, tend to be smaller. Um, the Human Development Index is 161. This is actually below Tanzania, if you, if you remember the numbers from the previous slide. Um, interesting things about Uganda. Firstly, I, I haven't been there. I've been there before, about four, or five, four years ago, I think. So this was my second trip into Kampala. And there are these things called border borders. They're basically motorbikes that operate as taxis. It is unbelievable how motorbikes have taken over all of the roads. Right? For every car that goes down the road, there are five motorbikes, six or so, that will pass in the same period of time. Right? So I know it's insane trying to cross the road at any point in time because they're all traveling at different speeds. And it's one lane, but there's probably two or three lanes of motorbikes at the same time as the one lane of cars, which is very fast. Um, what I also discovered, because Grace took me there one day, was that the, they have the eighth largest mosque in the world, in Kampala. Um, you, know, you, always try to, you always assume that South Africa has some of these very large buildings and things like that, but you know, they're quietly getting on with things there. Um, also, with a very interesting cultural performance, thanks to our ex-students from, from here. Um, 
but I, I spent most of my time in Uganda actually having meetings with people, of course, because that's what I was there for. Uh, this, the picture is not a picture of the computing faculty. The, the computing faculty is probably the buildings. If you put them together, are probably bigger than that. That's the administration building. Um, they have a college of computing and information science. So at some point in time, the structure seems to be evolving very rapidly. Every two or three years, something happens in, in, in Makerere. And at the moment, they have a school of computing within this college. And the school of computing has about four departments, computer science, information technology, information systems. And then there's software engineering slash networks. It started off as networks because they had some kind of uh, Cisco Academy at the university. But then this has been evolving into software engineering somehow. Um, somehow to keep in, in, in touch with the ACM and how they define computing. They have 80 staff, 20 of them have PhDs, um, 1,200 first years, 900 third years. I think they, they claim to have about 5,000 students in total. Um, there's a taught masters. I, don't, I don't, didn't get a number for that. They, have, they publish one journal and they have one conference that the university actually leads every year. Um, and this was rather interesting because the last time I went to Uganda, I attended this conference and I thought it was really good. And this time I heard that the quality had, de had gone down, they had declined substantially, and they had frozen this conference. So they're no longer having this conference. And what this means actually is that there is no computer science, there is no large inter country computer science conference in the whole of East Africa, if you want to think of it that way, because this one has been stopped. This used to be the only one. Um, so I, gave, so I gave a seminar on the Ds for development, and some of you have, have heard a version of this in the ict for d lab the last time I was talking about this. Um, and I also spoke about preserving African heritage. Um, I met with lots of the staff individually. There are some who are very strong on research, but they are very, very focused on local problems. Uh, incredibly focused. Um, so they are doing things like natural language processing, but natural language processing in local languages. <coughs> There are lots of research projects around um, malaria um, and, and various things related to malaria. Uh, I was interested to see that they were working, they were actually doing research on the traffic problem itself. And uh, so they're clearly being influenced directly by what's, by what's happening in the local environment. Um, they do have a PhD program of some sort, um, but yeah, there are various people who are training as PhD students. You know, um, something else I discovered as I went along, uh, incidentally, the guy who was working in the building next door is somebody by the name of Mahmoud Mangdani. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He's rated as one of the 20, 20 what, most highly respected public intellectuals in the world. Um, and he works in development. And he had an office in the building next to computer science. They didn't know this. Um, so in fact, I went over, I had a, a, a quick chat with him um, and tried to make a connection between them. But I don't know if that's going to work. Um, then I went to Kenya next. Next up, Kenya, 44 million people. Uh, I've got deferring numbers from, from Kenyans about how many universities there are. I think things are changing quite rapidly. I was very amused to see that when you, as you zoom in on, on Google, maps.google.com, you, you zoom in on the map of Nairobi and you see an increasing number of universities showing up. Because there are some very small institutions all around the city. Right? Um, so I was told there were about 30 or 30, I'm saying, I'm saying 14 public universities because this is what the, what the numbers on the internet say today. Um, they are slightly better off in terms of human development index, but they're not that far off from the other countries as you can see. Traffic congestion is unbelievable in Nairobi. Um, it is really well beyond anything you have ever seen in Cape Town. Right? Um, but they have bad motorbikes. They don't have motorbikes, right? They have vehicles and they do not, follow any rules that I can, t I can tell. Um, I don't believe they are even, I have not seen anybody following a traffic light, although they have traffic lights. Uh, and the traffic on Sunday afternoon when I arrived in Nairobi was worse than rush hour traffic in Cape Town. Um, so they, they have some, some things to deal with. The important thing about Nairobi is that this is really, from their perspective and from the perspective of lots of other people, this is considered to be the center of ICT in Africa. It's not Johannesburg or any place in South Africa. It's, it's considered to be Nairobi generally. Um, the, the pictures on the right hand side are uh, things that random things I took in the museum. Uh, the museum in, in Nairobi, in my opinion, far is far far better than the Cape Town Museum, right? Uh, so if you ever have a chance to compare these things, you'll see that you see a, a direct comparison between <coughs> levels of development because they put a lot of effort into this, and you know, it, it's pretty much a world standard. 
University um, Museum. This happens to be one of the uh, an original fossil in, in some kind of special, uh, well-preserved area for skulls that, that are easily accessible to people, uh, members of the public, because it's a, it's a well-put-together museum. In South Africa, I think it's fairly difficult to actually see some of the original uh, fossils. I don't know how many of you have tried this. Apparently, in the, what is it, the Transvaal Museum, or whatever it used to be, whatever it's called today, you can see the original fossils from the Sturdfordian Caves. Has anybody actually seen that? No? You see, I haven't either. <laughs> I went to the area where the Sturdfordian Caves are, and then I discovered that they're not kept there. Um, okay, so Kenya had lots of interesting things about it. Uh, so from a cultural perspective, I think it's important to understand uh, what's going on. Firstly, the level of development was quite astounding. I would. Now, I, I would peg it between Cape Town and Johannesburg. I think they've, they've far surpassed what, what we would consider to be our level of development, but they haven't really hit what Johannesburg is like today. Um, historically, I found there were some shocking similarities with South Africa. I found examples of past books in the museum. I didn't realize they had the same ridiculous British system at some point in their history. Um, and there are some other uh, interesting historical issues there, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, local culture, new things about, about local culture. I found there was, a, there was a lot of emphasis on making statements about corruption. Um, and I thought this was interesting because I didn't really see this anywhere else. In South Africa, we, we really you know, see this under the carpet. But uh, there were various buildings where there were signs, large signs out there saying, you are in a corruption-free zone. In fact, as you get to the University of Nairobi, there were big signs on either side saying exactly the same thing. Now, I spoke to people about this, and they, they actually didn't really understand that. I'm, maybe Audrey has uh, opinions on this. Um, but it, it seemed interesting that it was kind of put out in, your, in there. It was out in the public that we are somehow thinking about this issue. And something we don't do. Um, and then, of course, there was the infamous, there the infamous park benches that say on the back, refuse to just sit here, we'll make a change. Uh, and every, every so often, we'd find somebody actually sitting on the bench. Uh, so, so the, well, up there. I was hosted in Kenya by the Kenyan National <coughs> University, which is Charles Institution. Um, also visited two other universities. But the Kenyan Methodist University has a college of computing, like many of the other institutions. It's a, so computing was considered to be pretty, pretty much a top level uh, topic of interest. Again, it was computer science and information science. Um, they have 30 lectures, only no PhDs yet. I think they expected five of these people to come back very soon. Um, and at the point when these people come back, they will start thinking about postgraduate programs. They are actually trying to do some kind of research with the people who only have master's degrees, and this is generally very difficult for most people. The reason why they are probably more successful than others is because um, some of the people who, are, who have master's degrees are currently enrolled in PhD programs in the University of Nairobi and other universities in Kenya because there are a lot of them in the same area. But they have about 1,000 students as well. So they have lots and lots of these students at an undergraduate level. And this was, I think, the smallest institution I visited. Um, Strathmore University is bigger in their faculty of IT. And University of Nairobi has a computer science and I think it's computer science and IS together in one department. Um, so I gave them all a seminar talking about digital libraries and development. Um, now, I'll come back to what the, I haven't said anything about how people reacted to these seminars, because we'll come back to that. But I also had meetings with uh, two of the innovation centers and uh, a meeting with people at Google, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Along. So, last stop was Zambia, uh, which I didn't think was East Africa until I spoke to the Zambians. Um, 14 million people. This is a fairly simple story three public universities, three private. They are 163 out of 187 on this development index. And this is fascinating because Zambia has unbelievably rapid development. So we had long discussions about this while I was there. The Zambians didn't see it. But when I came in from the outside and I looked at them and I compared them with other countries, I could see that they were building like it was being out of fashion. Plus, they were absorbing culture. They were absorbing the culture from either South Africa or China. Now, the Chinese are pushing very, very hard to to get a foothold into Africa. But at the same time, South Africa seems to be doing this as well. So I went to two of the shopping malls in Zambia, uh, where it was just all South African shops. Nothing but South African shops, right? Um, now at some point, 
I think we had, we had some arguments about the last one or two that, that we didn't see in South Africa, but the other hundred shops were also Africa. And it was that kind of a situation. Um, there were also very few elements, there were very few signs of Zambian culture. And this is something that, you know, we had a long debate about this at the university, about the disappearance of, of a unique culture in Zambia. Uh, that freedom statue was one of the, the only signs that I could see of something that, that people will associate with Zambia somehow. Okay, so the University of Zambia, which is where I spent my week there, has nine staff, two people with PhDs, and because they have two people with PhDs, they are starting a master's program. Right? The one person with a PhD arrived a few months ago, now they have two, the, the master's pro, a taught master's program will start in the next semester. Uh, they only have about 70 undergraduate students, and, and these are split among three different years, second year, third year, and fourth year. The first year is something that they do as a general science degree. And uh, while I was there, I think I convinced them that, that, that really, they don't need to only take 70 students, they could take 200. <laughs> So it was a question of somehow reorganizing the resources and they started having discussions about how they would do that. Um, the good thing though is that um, lots of their staff are new and lots of them have got their master's degrees from outside the country and they've just come back in. Zambia, this being the, stand, the premier state university in Zambia, if you want to think of it that way, um, and if they don't have a master's degree, degree, it means people have to go somewhere else to get it. Uh, they are not the strongest in computing, however. The strongest in computing is apparently um, a university which is about 150 kilometers away. Right. Okay, so same time as Australia, I gave two seminars here. They wanted me to talk to all of so they, they bundled all the students into a room at some point in time and I spoke to them about doing postgraduate studies and what it means to do research in computer science. Uh, and besides meeting with them, I also went to the local innovation hub. So, that's like the tour of, of going to these places. The, the inescapable aspects of East Africa, <laughs> the things that I found in everywhere that I went, right? Firstly, the one I was expecting was coffee, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you drink coffee. If, if you know anything about me, you'll know this is my signature thing, right? So I bought a little bit of coffee everywhere I went to. I have all those packets that they go out to things as well. Malaria is unbelievably in your face, right? And I've traveled in, in countries that have malaria before, but usually for about a week, maybe just over a week, but never for a month. And if you're there for a month and you're constantly being reminded of the fact that you need to be on medication, you need to uh, uh, be on bottled water, you, I went through I think three containers of insect repellent, um, and you just absolutely have to do this, and mosquito nets as well, right? So. It's, it's something that, that, and you can understand why there's an obsession among the researchers that for this being something that they need to be, that they need to address. Uh, African time caught me off guard here. Um, I think my first morning in Zanzibar, we started two hours late because I had to first be introduced to the management of the university before I could give my seminar. Uh, and you know, I think everybody, uh, after a while, after I think two weeks of uh, traveling, I eventually realized that, you know, Clearly, I'm here for the purpose of giving the seminar, so it doesn't really bother me. Um, but there, was, there wasn't a strong sense of, of time, which is a bit weird. I mean, we started this talk at what, one minute, two minutes past one. That has never happened to me. I gave 10 seminars, that has never happened. But I think we started between 20 minutes and two hours late in, in all of the instances. Um, mobile networks and services. It, this is another thing that is really in your face. You could not escape this. Everywhere you went, Mobile networks. There were, there were mobile networks everywhere. Um, there, there were more mobile networks than we usually find in South Africa. In my hotel in Kenya, I was on the 10th floor and I could pick up 30 Wi-Fi signals. Now, why are there 30 Wi-Fi signals high up in the air in the middle of, of the city? I don't know. But, but clearly this, this notion of being incredibly connected is, is very, very strong in this place. Um, there's lots of excitement about computing. Right, as I mentioned earlier, the, the capacity issues are still there. And what I didn't expect was, there were lots of people who said, you know, how can we come study at UCT? Um, I didn't get the sense that they knew a lot about UCT, but it was, it was an option, so they wanted to explore it as an option. Um, I ended up having about six, seven, eight meetings with potential students along the way. Okay, so now I'm switching tone a bit here, right? I'm talk about research, innovation, and development. So now that you know what I did, and what I was, where I visited, I'm trying to, I want to try to bring together some of these things into some themes. Um, 
So I was interested in finding out how, how do they approach research. Well, research is a bit easier. How do they approach innovation? That was, that was something I wasn't really thinking about. I was thinking more about how they approach development. Um, I think I found out more about innovation, though, but we'll, we'll go to this model. So in terms of research, I spoke to people about research groups. The small universities have nothing. There's no, no structure. There's very few people doing research. The larger universities seem to be focusing on things that are either traditional computer science or have strong links to what's happening in society. So computational linguistics, I was surprised to find people who were very interested in this. And that's because of the large <coughs> number of languages being spoken in some of these countries. People quoted numbers between, well, uh, well up to 70 different languages in some of the places I visited. Um, in Makarele, I, I thought was, it was interesting. They have four research groups that have relatively recently been started. And on the first morning when I arrived there, the dean says, in Makarele, we do ict 14 we have four research groups. The first one is AI for ICT for D. AI for development, right? That's what it's called. Software and enterprise engineering for development. Uh, then there's development informatics, which already has development in it. And there's wireless networks and whatever else for development. Right? So everything is for development. Um, which I think wasn't, well, it was, it's interesting that that's how they cast it. Um, but, you know, they, it's not really sure this is what they should have been doing. Um, in Nairobi, which is the only other place that has research groups, they were strongly focused on first the ICT for D because, of course, we have one of our students who just moved here recently. Um, and they also recently started something on mobile money. But, but these are all new. And this is the thing both, both Nairobi and Makarere, we know in places that have thought about research groups, um, these are like two or three years old at most, right? Uh, this isn't a long tradition of having these research groups. <laughs> research funding, of course, and this I could have guessed before, but there, there's almost no research funding. Uh, there were some people who were relatively successful, and they were getting money from industry. So they were getting grants from Microsoft, Google, IBM, all kinds of companies, because there was no government funding. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, picture up there, the picture up there is uh, um, a cell phone, that, uh, that can be used to detect malaria by connecting some kind of little camera to the cell phone. Um, it was a project developed with funding from Microsoft. Um, and I think the students won some kind of international award and it was in the news about three or four weeks ago. I don't know if you saw this. It went through all the computer science mailing lists about a month ago because these students from Akira have won this international award for this project. Um, I found it interesting to see that um, in Makarere, even the staff, they, they, it doesn't really bother them that they couldn't go to a conference because there's no money. They got paper accepted. Well, I got paper accepted, but nobody went um, because there just isn't anything. Um, in Zambia, I discovered I knew some people because they had applied for conference funding for conferences I was involved with. Right? So sometimes people are applying for, for scholarships, in scholarships in order to get to the conference because they, they just not, they're not getting the funding locally. Um, and what we also found is that a lot of them would apply to any kind of external funding. So UCT offers funding to people to come visit, um, to visit us for a three month period for some kind of a research experience. And you know, we hosted various people in our department last year, as you know. But I met a lot of people who knew about this. So in these universities, people knew about this. And in fact, some of the people had, had applied this year to come to UCT, and I don't know if they will come or not. Staff development linked to funding is something that a lot of people take very seriously. Uh, I don't know how many of you will remember Mayumbo, maybe Sonia does. Uh, Mayumbo was one of our ex-students from about six, seven years ago. Um, and he, was, he went back home to teach in Zambia. And then there was a university to university <coughs> agreement between his university in Zambia and some university in Japan. So he went across to do his PhD. Uh, and this seems to be quite common. There are direct. Um, relationships that the universities have with other, um, either other universities or other countries, and then they send their staff over to study further. I met somebody in Zanzibar who got funding from some agency that says, well, you just find a good place to do your PhD and we'll give you money to do it. Um, so there were lots of different options for how these people went around. Um, it, the, the model was slightly different in Kenya and Uganda, where I found that a lot of people wanted to do their PhDs locally. So in in Zanzibar and Zambia, there was, a, there was more interest in people coming to Cape Town because they had to go somewhere else to do the PhD. But in Kenya and Uganda, the, the universities themselves 
could support people doing PhDs locally. So most people didn't necessarily want to travel far away to do a PhD. Maybe if you went to another university which had supervision capacity, you could do it. Um, and then the students were, so there were some interesting things about the students. Firstly, I was surprised to find Nairobi had 110 master students. Um, apparently, they, they don't really have enough supervision capacity, but they have 110 master students. In Strathmore University, they have a whole lot of master students, but they're driven hard by industry. So industry gives them funding, and the students are required to do a project that results in a mobile app. And there was a lot of unhappiness about this, right? Uh, because the, there was too much of a link they felt between industry and, and the university in that case. Um, Makareli was the only place where, where I thought there was a rel relatively stable, streamed master's program, but still, once again, it was, it was a taught master's program. Uh, so all of them had taught <coughs> uh, work. Nobody was doing the kind of master's degree that we do in South Africa. And, and the larger universities had some PhD students. Okay, so the research picture is, is slightly bleak maybe, but, but something that we probably know a lot about and, and we're expecting. The innovation picture is, is slightly more interesting. So it turns out that in many places, people are setting up these things called innovation hubs. And we have this thing called Bandwidth One in Cape Town. And Bandwidth One is just another innovation hub. So I visited some of the innovation hubs. Um, to talk to them about what they do, what they do and how they do it. So the iHub in Kenya is probably the most well-known innovation hub in, in Africa. It's about three years old, it's not that old. I, I great thought this had been around for longer. Um, but it's a, they have an independent space in the middle of the city. Well, they have, there's a couple of floors of the building where they provide some kind of common space for people to work. It's a very strange idea that they provide space for people to work they're not necessarily supporting projects or anything like that. They're giving independent developers some area where they can come and meet other developers and maybe work in a quiet environment. Um, it looks a bit like that picture at the top there. They didn't really know what research is. And this is the, this is the premier, one of the premier computing facilities in terms of reputation around the continent. They didn't know what research is. I sent them an abstract for a talk and they didn't understand what the abstract was. So then I had to write them, uh, something that looked like a blog post. And, and they could understand that. So that was a bit shocking. Um, they, they're not focused on, on startup companies at, in this iHub in Kenya. They have some anchor projects. I don't know how many of you have heard of Shahidi. But uh, it seems like they built this iHub on top of a few successful open source projects. They had, they had some open source projects that built this entire infrastructure on top of that. They got lots of money. They're very good at branding. Uh, they got enough money that I believe they want to buy this six-story building eventually. Um, and does it say something about staff? Um, they have quite a lot of staff. There's about 30 staff who are full-time employees at this IHUB. Um, they have some collaboration, but they operate something like an NGO. So the idea being that if you are excited about computer science and you want to develop, let's say, some killer application and you don't know where to start, then you can somehow link up this IHUB and you can work there and maybe find other people work with you or something like that. So I went to the alternative in Nairobi. The alternative, the, the, the major direct competitor, I suppose, is iLab Africa. And iLab Africa is based at Strathmore University. It's even younger, it's two years old. And they are completely about incubation. So, and they will tell you, iHub doesn't do this. Right? What we do is incubation. So if you have an exciting idea for a project, you go there on Friday and you have this pitch Friday thing where you do your Pecha Kucha talk or something like that and they may give you a space and some money, right? And then you can sit there for I don't know how much time and eventually develop a product, right? So they, they focus on people who are coming who are entrepreneurs who are trying to develop products uh, and they get some of their students from within the Safari from the Academy, which is on the floor above them, um, or actually the floor below them. They get some of the students internally pretty much, but then this is open to anybody. They're doing, they're doing all of this, but I didn't see any real success stories. So I didn't see anybody saying you know, they've come up with this really exciting product recently. But then they're only two years old, so they don't know. Um, they seem to have more ideas about research because they're based in the university. But they're very strongly focused on mobile application development training. So they really want to drive through this process of everybody learning how to create mobile apps. And unfortunately, it's because Safaricom is, is funding some of this. And Safaricom is, is, a, is a mobile company. And once again, they also have about 30 staff. 
So I asked them, what is the T staff? You know, are these postgraduate students? No, these are not postgraduate students. These are all full-time researchers. Right? How are they getting 30 full-time researchers in, in one of these innovation centers? They're working on industry projects. So apparently Samsung has gone to them and said, will you test all of these applications to make sure they work in your local context? And so they have researchers who are working on, on those things. They kind, it's kind of industrial research, but this is what they're focusing on right now. So the third innovation hub I went to is something called Gongo Hive. Gongo Hive is in Zambia, uh, less than two years old. So this is very, very new. Uh, and their focus is strongly on mobile application development. So I walked into the building and it, I walked into the middle of a class. In fact, the entrance to the building was the entrance to the classroom. So I actually had to walk through all of the people having some, some lectures on mobile application development to get to the offices. Uh, they want to do incubation. Basically, in the Zambian case, they consider the industry to be very, very new, and they would like to get those people who are interested in computing, irrespective of what their qualifications are, whether they, whether they went to university or not, if they're interested in learning programming, or they can program, then they want to somehow encourage them by giving them skills and things like mobile application development, and eventually they hope that these people go out there and trade products and start companies and things like that. Um, they are starting some kind of collaboration, but they are, they're very small, we have three staff working at this. And I think this is the only innovation hub of some sort in Zambia, as far as I can tell. Okay, so that was, uh, I'll, I'll come back and contextualize that a little bit later. So the thing that I was really looking for was development. Right? How are people viewing ICT for me? And I was very surprised about development because firstly, they all had a development plan. Every country has a development plan, and they all knew it. They all knew it. ICT was a key part of, of every plan. Now, if you read the South African National Development Plan, you'll see that ICT is almost not mentioned at all. Right? Whereas in these places, ICT was a key part of the plan. In, in many places, the government has a ministry of ICT of some sort. Right? There's a minister of computing. I know, I'm not sure exactly how that works. But they still don't have direct government funding. Right? And that's something that I think uh, is, is a bit of an issue. There are lots of local priorities, and here we see some differences, uh, I, I suppose, from the things that we do sometimes. Um, the, the priorities are, are different depending on where you go. So, for example, in Uganda, malaria was like, I wouldn't say, it was almost number one priority among the researchers I spoke to. There were more people, there were more research projects related with dealing with malaria, related to dealing with malaria than anything else that I could see. Um, Kenya is, well, there's about to be an obsession about OLPC because Kenya is going to uh, you know, go to the OLPC issues. Um, and then I found that they were also dealing with issues that um, there are development priorities in their countries uh, that we don't normally think about here. So for example, the found an interesting organization in Uganda um, that concentrated on women's rights by using technology. Right? Uh, they were impossible to get hold of. They didn't answer email or anything like that. Um, but I discovered they were actually collaborating with people at the university. So women's rights using technology. And they had all kinds of different projects about this. There was one, uh, another group in Uganda who were focusing on democracy, using ICT to somehow increase the, the notion of democracy. Um, in Kenya, the, the people who work at iHelp had come up with a project that was going to, to monitor election violence. Right? And so, so for the recent Kenyan election, they ran this project where they, they tried to monitor, monitor any events that had occurred during the election period, report them and somehow deal with them. And it, it was a bit complicated, uh, but they were addressing this issue of safety and security, which is something that I don't think we think about very much when we think about ICT for deal. So the, if, if they are concentrating on the local priorities, the question is how does this relate back to the international context? And somebody I have told me very clearly, the word ICT for D is taboo. We don't use this word around here, right? This is a cliche, nobody wants to talk about it. If you want to talk about education, you talk about education, you talk about healthcare, that's fine, but you don't talk about ICT for D. Um, apparently, it's, I think it's been overused in the past, right? And that followed through in my seminars. I gave 10 seminars. There was not a single, and the seminars were actually 50% ICT for D in most cases, 50% digital library type stuff. Not a single question was ever asked about ICT for D. I had lots of questions about 
preservation of digital information and digital archives. Not one person asked this in Iceland, which I, initially I thought this was a bit weird. But then I realized this is not something, this is not the language that they use to talk about data. Nobody ever talked about the UN Millennium Development Goals. They're already focusing on development, but they're not using the language that has been externally defined in order to talk about this. And there was no theoretical framing of the And this I thought was interesting because I was hoping to go there and find that somebody had thought about this to a great degree. But it seems like it's fairly early days for most of the computing research, that nobody's tried to bring together different ideas and come up with a, a meta idea or, or some kind of framework of some sort. So bringing all of this together, and this may be the, the controversial side here, right? Uh, what I've seen is that there's a lot of ICT innovation happening, but it's, pro it's progress in ICT through innovation only. Now, the way they have defined innovation means that you come up with an idea, you develop a system, and then you implement it. And there's three aspects to this. The first thing is they're doing development in spite of any research capacity. Because until recently, they have had no research capacity in most of these places, and some of them still don't have any research capacity. They've, they've built an entire ecosystem around doing innovation without research. And this is a bit scary, because it means that you can put a lot of resources into something, into, let's say, building products, without having done any of the early research to see whether this product is going to work in the first place. It's what I'm going to call Thomas, Thomas development. So you're not really grounding this very strongly. And you know, this is where you come up with these interesting questions. Does it work? How do you know if it works? So Impesa is the famous example. It works. It works in some places. It doesn't work in other places. And how do people know that it works in some places and not in other places? Because they, they try it. They go out there and they try it. And if it works, then everybody's happy. But you're not really sure why it's working or anything like that. This Ushahidi project that came out of Kenya is a a, uh, it's like a crowdsource slash content management system. And it is, it's interesting that the project has existed for about five years, has got fantastic publicity internationally and things like that. And this year, they've decided to do the first evaluation. Right? They've never tested to see if this project has any actual impact before. They were just very happy that they got all the money and they got all the publicity. And now they're actually trying to prove something. So they've started to go back and, and try to answer the question whether this has any impact. So uh, two slides from the end. I thought, so the first thing was, everywhere that I went, I wanted to ask, I asked the question, what can we do for you? Right? So, so if there was some way that we could do something from UCT or from South Africa, what would you want? The, the number one ask was training of PhDs. Right? It was quite clear that the most important thing that, that anybody wanted in any of these computing departments was training PhDs. Some of them wanted to maintain links to build their research cultures. And I think these were usually the smaller institutions. There were people who explicitly asked about staff exchanges, about somebody from here visiting some East African university, or the other way around, or teaching of, of short courses. But these were all, you know, I, would just, I would say these, are, these last issues here were fairly minor. The maintaining links is somewhat important, but the training of PhD is just overload everything else in terms of importance. Um, and after all of this, the question, of course, is what are the implications for us and for what we are doing? Well, the first thing, of course, is the, the, the tough lesson that I suspected when I, when I started with this trip was it is quite clear, and it is clear the way that, in, that everybody knows this as well, that we are not the ICT hub of Africa. Everybody seems to know this, right? And <coughs> <laughs> if, if people in, in these other countries progress at the rate that they have been progressing in the last five years, they are simply going to entrench their position as being the, the center of ICT work. Now, what that work is, whether it's research innovation or whatever else, is a different story. Uh, while I was there, apparently, I, I, I learned that IBM has just set up a research center in Nairobi as well. So now Google has their offices, their, their Africa offices in Nairobi, but IBM has a research center in Nairobi. They're not choosing South Africa first. Uh, I don't know if we should be worried about this. Clearly, we are not excited about ICT, or we're not as excited as some of, as some of these other people. Do we do something about it? I don't know. Um, the, this notion of innovation and, and research, there's a strong, there's an unbelievable focus on innovation in all of the places I went to. 
not as much focus on research. Whereas if you come here, we don't focus on innovation all that much. So the question is, do we need, should we be looking at some other uh, point in that <coughs> continuum? So if you have a continuum between research and innovation, are we in the right place? Or should we, be have, should we emphasize the innovation aspect of what we do slightly more? Um, I don't know, but I think it's something to think about. Um, and the last thing that I, that I asked uh, as a question after talking to all these people is, are we thinking of ICT for D in too much of a theoretical fashion? Because all of these people are doing development work, but they're not, they're not talking about it in the jargon of ICT for D. They are simply addressing problems that are local. And they're getting on with the job, if you want to put it that way. Whereas we seem to think a lot about this and maybe not get along, get on with the job as much as we would like to. So these are all open questions. I'm going to stop at this point and ask for questions and comments. Thank you. Um, yes. your, sorry, I don't know if I cut that on anymore. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, your evidence for East Africa's ICT hub was that, it sounds like you were saying the evidence is big corporate offices and lots of people trying things. Uh, but no, the primary evidence is if you ask anybody, okay. where is the place where all the exciting ICT work happened? Okay. They will probably say it's between you know, Uganda, Kenya, something like that. Sure, sure. Um, do those corporate offices have the, the foreign offices, do they have programmers in them? Like, as far as I know, the Google office it doesn't. Do they have programmers? Yeah. Okay, so I, can tell you, I don't know how much I can tell you about the Google office. <laughs> but I suppose whatever they told me should be fine, right? Um, so I, I didn't visit IBM because I didn't realize that they had a new office, and besides it was a new office. Um, the Google office, they do have some development capacity. It's very limited. And uh, apparently they have, they have an issue right now that when they come up with something exciting and they have already come up with some exciting stuff, it gets moved to yeah. Europe. That's a bit unfortunate. Uh, I mean, for me, surely where excitement, well, I don't know about the word excitement, but where the hub is, is where the competent programmers are. And it feels like South Africa has an edge in that department. I, I think if you go internationally and you ask any of the funders who fund these things, uh, okay. right, they're going to, they're not going to say that we are the hub. Probably okay. because maybe we have bad branding, I don't know, but mm. um, there, there are people from Kenya who are far more well known as being entrepreneurs in the ICT for development space than the people from here. Sure. innovation without research idea, it's always seemed to me obvious that you can either do exciting new things in a small company or at the university. I don't see why um, the approach of a, of a small startup is any less research. In fact, they might not articulate it, but they've got a pure pragmatist epistemology. If it works, it's true, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, I might not say it that way, but that's, that's, that's the proof. So that, that was my one comment. The other one is on South Africa and, us, and, and not having any ICT policy. And that is a huge failure um, of our various government departments that have fought about ownership of ICT ever since the early 90s. And I'm trying to think why it never happens that we get. So, so you know, Department of Communications trying to grab it. It was very clear it was never going to work. And I don't think it's ever going to work because our government is not about doing anything. Our government is about uh, running a government and finding places for all the interest groups that you're trying to accommodate. So it's in the interest of our government to have many, many ministries. And any ministry which grabs hold of anything useful will immediately be attacked by all the other ministries. So we've seen that with the Department of the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of, uh, 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 Technology, Department of Industry, uh, even the Public Service Department, trying to grab ICT. And they were killed at any point at which they looked as if they were going to be successful. Plus, add to that, 
our colonial mentality of trying to import the best European practice. And, and the end result of putting that in a government department that is incompetent is simply to encourage corruption. But I think for those various reasons, that's my take on why it doesn't happen and probably will never happen. Well, I'm not, I'm not convinced it needs to happen. I mean, well, I'm just putting, laying it out there as things are done differently elsewhere. So, um, so you say that East Africa is considered the higher rather than South Africa. Is that not perhaps a function of quantity more than excitement? I mean, they have so many more students doing IT. Is that not why? Uh, no, but, <coughs> so I don't think it's... Uh, the, the excitement bit is something where that you, that's visible. So in the streets there will be advertisements for let's say let's say the cell phone companies. The, the cell phone companies are probably the biggest thing out there. Um, every lamp pole will have a, an advertisement for some cell phone cell phone company, and it's a uh, it, it somehow infuses the society that this is about technology. So it's, I don't think it's just the students, um, and this. So the, this, I suppose there's a number of different things. The fact that there's that government support in some sense, that it's strongly in the ICT for development plan, um, that uh, they are producing those students, that in fact all of the universities are strongly supporting the, the production of even more students. So it's a number of these things that are being somehow put together to create this vibe that this is the way it's happening. Just, sorry. I, can I follow up on that? Um, but for the point precisely that there are so many people there. And the reason there are so many people there is because they actually have a functioning education system. As opposed to us, where sadly we're sadly perpetuating the rules policies. Okay. They have mathematics graduates, we do not. They have mathematics school leaders, and we do not. So it's precisely because they have a good educational system on a sort of global basis, and South Africa does not. That you have the people, that you have the other consequences. Uh, Grace first thing on the Is um I'm not quite sure that I'll agree with you on the concept of innovation and uh, research in another academic environment because to be a good researcher I need to be innovative. That's why then uh, I also suppose that among the academics you talk to I think the academics talk to in the university of Tuesday, they must have put about research and research projects that are actually supervising academic and you decided to categorize them as innovations and that research. No, no, sorry, sorry. Just, just to clarify here, right? And so when I talk about innovation or research, I'm not talking about those research projects at the university. Right? Because there are those, but there's a lot of other things happening besides that. But we are comparing the universities in East Africa to UCT. No. I was saying they are being more innovative and more research. No. No, I'm, I'm comparing the the general social outlook there. So the, the not just the universities, but the fact that they have these other centers that are doing innovation, um, and especially that, that even some of the universities are doing innovation at the, at the level of undergraduate degrees. Okay, in that aspect, there was a different kind of innovation and research. Right. So this is so. You, you've hit on something I didn't talk about in the presentation. In the middle of this trip, I, I discovered that the definition of innovation is different in East Africa and in South Africa. Right? So the, the, the traditional definition of innovation is some new idea. That's like the de dictionary definition. Right? If you go to UCT's innovation office, you find, ah, that's not what it is. Because according to the South African government, and in fact according to, let's say, probably the European Union and whoever else, innovation is a process that kicks in after primary research. Whereas in the view of, in, in view of the people that I was talking to, there was this highly interconnected research and innovation system. So you came up with an idea, then you did some research, then you, you know, worked on the idea some more. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't separated. Whereas in our, in, in what is called the South African system, National System of Innovation, these things are, are clearly separated. There's research, and then there's innovation, and then there's production, or something like that. So, so yeah, you, know, you, you hit, on, hit the nail on the head there, right? 
innovation doesn't have one definition, it depends where you go. I don't know if there's anything that needs to be done, but I, I think that, uh, in, in my opinion, what, what I have seen is that there's a strong sense of branding that has made that into the hub. They don't have as many success stories as you really think, as you think they might have. If you dig deep and you find out how many success stories do they have, and you compare that against, let's say, successful ICT projects in South Africa, you will probably figure out that we've created more interesting things here. But they have very good branding. And you know there must be all kinds of cultural reasons, whatever else, but people seem to like working in that part of the world. Um, so I think that should, that's the wrong reason for some place to be considered a hub. So if somebody's looking for you know, experts in development, they're probably going to go to Nairobi because that's, that's the hub of research in this, in this area, right? That's the way that they're seeing it. Because of course, you know, they're not differentiating research, innovation, different definitions of these things and whatever else. That's where the excitement is. So, I think there is something to be done actually. And I think that the something to be done is, uh, is, is naturally going to happen in East Africa, which is they're going to improve on their research. They're working very strongly on doing that. The question is, are we going to meet them halfway with improving on our innovation? However you define innovation. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Martin has been very quiet. <laughs> and, I mean, you, you had an experience with Nokia that went the other way. Don't you yeah, I have a different take on all of this, yeah. but I don't know if this is the right place to get into it. So I was involved with uh, Google and IBM when they set up their labs in Kenya. And the reason that they gave for setting the labs up there is that they don't consider South Africa to be part of Africa. We might physically be here, but it's not, it's atypical. So they decided, and they're, uh, they were aware of the things that you've talked about, about the kind of lack of depth in PhDs and research capability, but uh, to them it was worth that risk. And so Nokia also took that risk for the same reason. They tried to work with the University of Nairobi, couldn't get enough PhDs quickly enough, which is why they've moved to South Africa. So it's, it will be very interesting to see how this plays out. And I agree with you, and, and if you talk to Shiko, she'll say the same thing about this dichotomy between innovation and research. It's just everyone there is enthusiastic and builds apps, and we can make this, and we can change the world, but it's not founded on anything. They just build it and, you know, according to the fine principles of Dewey, it will either work or it won't. And that's the kind of model of research, which I guess is what you're hinting at at the end, is our European, American-centric view of research a useful one? Or should we look at this other approach, which is just build stuff and see what works? And like you, I, I don't know enough to have, make any value judgments on it, but it is interesting. Yeah, I, I do think, well, one comment. I, may, I do think we should work on our branding, even just departmentally. The, the other thing is just as a, I, I know from knowing a lot of people in business that it's considered, so Africa is considered a, a very different place to do business, and a much more exciting place to start new companies than Europe or the States. So, you know, a lot of business people like to work here because you can get an idea moving, you can start your own company, become independently wealthy very quickly, whereas you can't do that. So maybe we should have a bit more of a sort of, you know, from African business to African research, you know, try and get a little bit more of that cowboy style as opposed to not cowboy. 
Well, we have the perfect <laughs> example, right, of, of, not, of this not working here. Yeah. It's an office on the second floor, yeah. right? Uh, I don't know if anybody, any of our students have ever visited that office. I don't know if any of the students sitting here know about this office I'm talking about on the second floor, uh, which is a, what is it? Is it it's linked to, to the KPIT initiative and the bandwidth bar. Right? It's supposed to be about, on the wall. Yeah, it's supposed to be about people who have interesting ideas who want to explore what happens and how they could, you know, uh, be entrepreneurs. There was supposed to be somebody who, who sits in an office for three hours every week, or is it every day? Uh, there's a long story that had to move. Oh, they've moved, okay. <laughs> but so frustrated by exactly these, these same things. I went to the bandwidth barn a week ago, ten days ago, and I had the most bizarre conversation. And along and you know, I explain our research and they go, Oh great, do you offer internships? <laughs> no, we're a university. We we have, we take students. Oh, fascinating. And then you know, how much do you charge? No, we give it away for free. Blink, 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 blink. And so you're saying there's a, a misunderstanding between, you know, in the rest of Africa. It, it's also here. They have no idea what we do or why we do it. So when we, when we speak about branding, are we speak about branding from the point of view of, uh, of like from an academic setting? So you see teams to brand things better. And if so, then what is this thing to brand? Because a lot of a lot of projects that happen in recent with it that won't necessarily live beyond uh, research itself, which like this is great. Or so is it branding outside of the department? And if so, is there anything we can really do about that? Uh, well, I don't think you want an answer to that, right? But I think the short answer is branding in any and every form imaginable. And if you, so we work with this group of people in Germany called the Hasse Plattner Institute, and they are the epitome of branding. They are, they are over-branded. But absolutely everybody in Germany knows them. They're a small institute. Absolutely everybody knows them. So I, I have a big problem with this brand. So, but maybe it's a question of age. When I grew up, the whole advertising profession was considered suspect and probably immoral. <laughs> and it's, well, yeah. And certainly branding was the most artificial, valueless judgment you could make about anybody. So my interest is not so much in bloody branding as in what is the trajectory. Uh, is East Africa on a incremental curve going somewhere, which is a faster growing trajectory than the one we are on? And surely that's more about the content 